last week there was another general election in Europe. This time it was in the United Kingdom. And the results took people in Britain by surprise because it was expected, thanks to the opinion polls who got it all wrong, that it was a close election campaign and that both the mainstream parties, Conservative and Labour, would roughly get the same number of seats. It wasn't till we were well into the evening and the results began to come in, did people realize that this was not the case, that in fact the Conservatives were going to win an overall majority in the House of Commons and wipe out their Lib Dem allies from the coalition that had served before. This is in fact what happened the Conservatives got over 11 million votes. Their share was in the region of 36 to 38 percent of the vote. Labour got over 229 seats, 9 million votes. Their share was 30.5 percent, not too different from last time and the second lowest labor percentage since 1918. But as some analysts, including myself, had been arguing now for well over two years, the key to the British general election was not so much what happened in England, but what happened in Scotland. Why? because for a long time now there has been growing dissatisfaction in Scotland with the, the link to England and the United Kingdom. And though the Scottish referendum was lost by 10% uh, when it took place last year, what was not the case was that these sentiments went into decline, as often happens after a defeat. What effectively happened in Scotland, many people regretted the way they had voted. Other Scottish citizens were, frankly, disgusted by the triumphalist uh, celebrations in which Labour Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats indulged in uh, to, 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 to celebrate their big victory. And the Scottish National Party was overwhelmed by a surge of support uh, gaining 90 to 100,000 new members very rapidly. The Radical Independence Campaign and the Greens both benefited. And a mood began to develop in Scotland, which on a visit there I, I sort of saw very clearly that the way now to punish the UK state was to ensure that the Scottish National Party, the SNP, won most of the seats on offer. Was this possible? The mood indicated that it was. And that is the only part of the country where the pollsters got it right. The Scottish National Party won 56 seats in Scotland from 1.4 million votes and the rest of the parties were completely wiped out. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that in years to come, the 2015 general election in the United Kingdom could well be seen to be as significant as the famous 1945 election that took place after the Second World War. Why? for the following reasons. The 1945 Labour government, a landslide majority for Labour, pushed through a whole set of social reforms, a free health service, a free education system, the construction of a proper social democratic welfare state that 
put the lives of ordinary working people on a par with those of the rich, a redistribution of wealth. All these things began to take place and created a new consensus. And the Scots, like most other parts of the country, felt if this is what was on offer, who needed independence? And most of Scotland began to vote consistently as they had done previously for Labour. Scotland became a Labour fiefdom, a Labour stronghold because of the attachment to the 1945 reforms and that social consensus. This began to change with the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1979 where a majority of Scottish people voted against her and the Conservatives. And the Conservatives who had till then had a few MPs from Scotland began to lose those. So things began to change and the initial beneficiaries were of course the Labour Party which dominated Scotland. But with the advent of Tony Blair a Labour Prime Minister who modelled himself on Margaret Thatcher and said that he was working to take her consensus forward. More light touch regulation, more triumphalist wars, Thatcher in the Falklands, Blair in Iraq. Not realising that while this might play well in Middle England, though it didn't play too well there either, uh, it would play very badly in Scotland. The Scots were by and large opposed to all this. They were social democratic by instinct. They didn't like uh, the adventures in which Labour was taking them. And there were huge demonstrations in Scotland against the war in Iraq. And I think that particular event undermined more than anything else the Scottish dislike of new Labour. And it was then only a question of time. Having a Scottish Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, for a short time possibly held the tide back for a bit. But it was soon very obvious that a Scottish National Party positioning itself to the left of Labour effectively defending a social democratic consensus, arguing it wanted to be nuclear free, that the expense of the Trident was not something Scotland wished to be part of or bear, and it wanted Trident out of Scotland, began to get more and more and more support. Even so, the idea that Scotland would do it this time was people weren't sure. Uh, Two days before the elections last week, Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish National Party leader, said she, she had seen the opinion polls, some of which were predicting that the SNP would win all the 59 Scottish seats in Parliament, but she said, I am not sure. We have to be cautious. So even within the SNP, at the top ranks of its leadership, there was a feeling that possibly the polls were exaggerating. Well, only marginally. The SNP won 56 out of 59 seats in Scotland. This meant that Labour was virtually wiped out. Its leader uh, enthroned in Scotland only a year or so ago by the Westminster party, uh, Murphy, lost his seat, numerous other Labour worthies and Lib Dem members of the coalition government lost their seats and Scotland celebrated. For Scotland it really was glad confident morning on the, uh, the, night, uh, the day after the elections. And so we have two different results. A happy result in Scotland and an unhappy result in England from the point of view of progressive people who were hoping that some change would take place in England as well. What was the reason for the scale of the Labour defeat? Now the problem is this, that Labour couldn't make up its mind how to play the election. And the reason for that is something I've described many times now over the years that we have in the Western world 
a system of politics and a system of government which I have called the extreme center, whether it's Democrats or Republicans in the United States, whether it's conservative or labor in Britain, whether it's conservative or socialist in France, whether it's the Christian Democrats or the Social Democrats in Germany, whether it's the Popular Party or the Socialist Party in Spain, effectively their core demands and their way of running the country is not all that different. And that is beginning to create a huge democratic deficit that many people feel they can no longer uh, rely on these parties to deliver the basic necessities of life. That these are parties of the rich, fat cat parties, whose own government ministers make a lot of money through their links with big corporations. Whether they are Labour or Tory doesn't matter. Both sides do it. Ed Miliband, who was elected Labour's leader after Gordon Brown's defeat, couldn't make up his mind as to what to do. On the one hand, he said, we have got to move beyond Tony Blair. Uh, we are no longer a new Labour Party. This is the Labour Party. On the other hand, the policies put forward were merely mild versions of what the Tories were already offering. Coupled with this, there was a huge campaign in the conservative press against uh, Miliband, pointing him out to be uh, uh, too radical, saying that if he did a coalition or any sort of arrangement with the SNP, these wild, crazy Scots would be running uh, Britain as well. This was unacceptable and a huge nationalist frenzy was whipped up by the Daily Mail, the Sun, uh, uh, etc. to highlight the Scottish threat. It almost seemed that the constant griping against Muslims and the Islamophobia had been replaced by a Scotophobia. The Scots were under attack and Labour, incapable of dealing with this, tended to capitulate to extreme centre views. And in this lies their errors and in this lies the fact that they might now never fully recover as a political party. What will happen to the Labour Party uh, we shall see. The voices were already being raised a few days after the election result that the big mistake that Labour had made and the BBC was showing a whole group of hardcore Blairites who had served with Tony Blair saying the big mistake that was made was not to stick to pure Blairism. That's how we won, uh, which is of course absurd because that's not only how they won, that's how they lost, not just uh, Scotland, but large swathes of England uh, as well. Another key issue, not fully debated in this election campaign, but hovering in the background, was immigration. Now, in times of economic crisis, all over the world, the question of immigration becomes fairly central, where you have large unemployment, precarious labor, insecurity, the easy target is foreign migrants. The problem with this within the European Union is that the European Union permits free movement of labor and capital within the Eurozone and within the EU as a whole. If you're part of Europe, you have to be uh, open to migration. And lots of English people work in France, many Italians work here, but the problem arose with the Eastern Europeans. The United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP, made this question of immigration central in their demands that we want all immigration from the European Union stopped. We're not opposed to the immigrants already here. 
to the uh, immigration from the Caribbean or Asia, which took place after the war. That's untouchable. But these new migrants, Poles, Romanians, Bulgarians, etc., these pose a problem to us. What they didn't fully grasp, but they might have posed a problem to the UKIP leadership, they certainly didn't pose a problem to British capitalism, uh, which needed cheap immigrant labor to do a lot of its dirty work. And they do do it, not just immigrant labor, but English labor, Scottish labor as well. Uh, they need them. Salaries are low. They're scared that trade unionized workers might fight for more, so they try and get people prepared to do an awful job for very, for very low wages. That's a fact. But the, the, the question is not whether this is the problem caused by the migrants, but by the social economic system that dominates Europe at the moment. But a question of the inability of capitalism at a system to deliver full employment any longer, which was one of its proud claims to fame immediately after the Second World War. Full employment was taken for granted. In the face of this, neither of the extreme center parties in England were capable of taking up the challenge. Labor had produced a mug which said immigration control. This was a Labor Party mug being sold on the Labor Party site. The Tories didn't have to say it too much because everyone knows they believe in it. The only party, once again, which defended immigration with the Scottish National Party, said Scotland is a better place with all its immigrants. And uh, why this unpleasant, nasty campaign against migration. And of course, on a lesser scale, so did the Greens. But for the mainstream, immigration became a central issue. And this too creates an unpleasantness uh, uh, in the country as a whole, because it avoids the real questions. Immigration always does that. It obscures the real questions by producing scapegoats. So on this question, as well, the Westminster parties were shown how they should have behaved by the Scottish National Party. So the Tories have won an overall majority in Britain, but the conditions in which they come to power remain unstable. Austerity, uh, which they claimed was absolutely necessary, and in this labor supported them, so there was no big difference except in the degree uh, 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 it's turned out to be a policy which people have voted for, but lots of people didn't vote for it. The turnout was as it at 60% plus, something like that, not hugely different from the last election, which means millions didn't vote. And traditional Labour supporters in Sunderland and others, usually safe labor seats, began to desert. And who did they desert to? There was nothing on the left of labor to which they could desert uh, because there was no alternative offered. They were not going to desert to the Greens because many, many white working class people would consider the Greens too airy-fairy. So they deserted to the only party which to them made some sense, and that, alas, was the UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, led by right-wing populists whose leader, Nigel Farage, lost his own seat, but they nonetheless gained 4 million votes. And now this brings us to the crux of the matter in England. That the country is effectively run under a first-past-the-post system, which means that in a particular constituency, if candidate X from party Y gets 12,000 votes, and all the others added up get 24,000 votes, the candidate with the 12,000 votes wins, and all the other votes do not count at all. 
This was always a system designed to keep democracy at bay, designed to keep conservative forces in power. Labour, unfortunately, never seriously challenged it. The Lib Liberal Democrats challenged it, but once they were part of the coalition, they couldn't get anything. Uh, uh, they, they, they wanted seriously. And so we are lumbered with a first-past-the-post system. If the United Kingdom Independence Party, a party of the populist right, with four million votes gets one seat, there's something wrong with the system. And if the Greens with 1.8 million votes or thereabouts get one seat, there is a problem because both Labour and Conservative with their votes are represented way out of proportion to the rest of the electorate. And this can't go on any longer. And it shouldn't be allowed to go on any longer and probably won't because with the Scottish vote now, what it is, I think the United Kingdom is nearing its end. I think essentially what is at stake now with this election and why it could be a counter to 1945, because if the victory of Labour in 1945 guaranteed the cohesion, the social cohesion of the United Kingdom, the Tory Conservative election victory of 2015 guarantees the breakup of this United Kingdom because the Scottish people are no longer prepared to go along with the social, economic and foreign policies of the extreme centre that dominates Westminster. That is in effect what we have seen. And of course, if this happens over the next five years, there's a new referendum in Scotland goes independent, that will be the end of the United Kingdom. So what will, what remains? be like. Effectively, it will uh, have to have a constitutional conference and a constitutional convention, a written constitution and a change in the electoral system. There will be a huge pressure building up because most people will find that they're not fully represented. And you have to have a proportional system, possibly like the Germans, possibly a purer one, in which parties are represented strictly on the basis of the number of votes. This is an undemocratic system. And it's a big tragedy for Labour. And now they, they, they pay the price. And this electoral system uh, was, of course, used to cement the New Labour project. The political geography of New Labour, when decoded, told a very clear story. The figures revealed a decline in voting, marking a growing alienation from politics. New Labour's popular vote in 2001 was down by 3 million and less than the 11.5 million won by Neil Kinnock when Labour suffered its defeat in 1992. The 71% turnout that had been considered low even in 1997 now dropped to 59%. Only 24% of the total electorate voted for another Blair government. Unsurprisingly, there were 2.8 million Labour abstentions in Britain's former industrial heartlands. The metropolitan vastnesses of Tyne and Ware, Manchester, Merseyside, the West Midlands, Clydeside and South Wales. It was traditional Labour supporters who decided that a walk to the ballot box wasn't worth the exertion. Who were they? white workers in the old mining districts, Asians in the Lancashire inner cities, under 25s in particular. As one traveled further north, the fall in turnout increased, dipping below 44% in the blighted constituencies near the shipyards on Tyneside, the bleak Glaswegian council estates and the semi-derelict terraces of Salford and central Leeds, below 35% in the wrecked zones of Liverpool's Docklands. 
It's important to remember these facts from the Blair period because one should not accept the dominant ideology of laborism which proclaims these as huge triumphs. They were electoral triumphs. They were not triumphs in terms of widespread labor support. They were essentially the product of a preposterous first-past-the-post, winner-takes-all system. And the Scottish triumph in Scotland in 2015 now puts a question mark. And the question mark is not just for Scotland, the question mark is for the United Kingdom. And what Labour does and how it uh, operates, we shall see in the next weeks and months. But effectively, the results in England have been a huge triumph for the extreme centre, and already there is pressure building up within Labour to move rightwards, even more to the right, to accommodate the dominant forces in uh, British politics and economics. What is the solution? I've argued that the model of the insurgent parties in South America and in the Mediterranean are an important step forward in explaining how to organize. It doesn't mean that all these groups have been successful or that they don't have problems of one sort or another, but something new is needed. We have in Britain today opinion polls that tell us that a large majority of people, and these are polls conducted outside the election period, they tell us that a large majority of the British people favor free education, favor a national health service which is not privatized, favor even clawing back the utilities, water, gas, electricity, which should not be uh, 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 you know, uh, industries that are used for profit because these are the essential needs of people. Favour cheap housing, favour a public transport system, want the railways taken back into public ownership. So why can't a party or a movement be formed in England on these principal demands to campaign around them, to build support, not just in Parliament, but as a mass social movement in cities big and small all over England. That, I think, is a medium-term solution to come up with something new, to challenge a system which is incapable of offering these facilities to its population. And, of course, this is not just a problem with England now, but it's a problem with the whole of uh, Europe. Things are changing. One big question has also now returned to the agenda. The Conservative Party pledged that they would organize a referendum on Europe. And this referendum will now take place. There is no way out of it. And it's a democratic thing to do because uh, the British people wanted a referendum on the European Constitution, were promised one, and were denied it. And this has been a big campaigning uh, uh, block for UKIP and other conservatives. And in my opinion, the left shouldn't run away from these things. They should say, yeah, let's have a proper debate on Europe. And nor should the left just line up blindly with the European elite, saying that the very idea of Europe is progressive, when we see what this European elite is doing to Greece today and what it might do to Spain tomorrow or, and is doing to Ireland and Portugal. So a proper debate needs to be had, uh, and it would be the first real debate on the future of the European Union and the Eurozone since the crisis of 2008. So not everything that has happened is, is, is bad in, in England. We shall see how it develops over the weeks and months to come. In the meantime, we can take comfort from what has happened in the north of the United Kingdom and look at how Scotland moves forward.